Amen. Praise God. Luke chapter 15. I've been thinking, just to kind of expound a little bit further on this morning's message, on what the heart of the Father looks like. Just to give a little glimpse of the heart of the Father. Jesus finds himself in a service. And it's, it's a gathering of people. Very unlike what we have here tonight. You know, I, I don't know the state of everyone's soul here tonight, but we're, we're a gathering of believers. I just want you to think for a second. Jesus had such a stark contrast of people that was with him at this particular time. You had the Pharisees and scribes, which, you know, Pharisees get a bad rap, and rightly so, but it, it's not like they were all bad, you know. <laughs> they, they sought holiness. They, they sought the Lord. They, they just kind of went about it the wrong way. And through their own righteous acts. And, but let, let's just kind of classify them in this story as th those who are morally right. At least they feel so. And at the same time, it says that tax collectors and sinners started coming to him. So just to think about, and I got to thinking about, you know, it's not like they didn't know each other. I, I can imagine that this Pharisee maybe grew up in kids' church at the temple with the person that ended up messing things up as a teenager. And they kind of chose a different path. You know, we all know people like that. Some of us have been people like that. And thank God for his mercies and redemption. And they found themselves together, you know. And it, everybody knew the, the town drunk, you know. He, he was there. And then the tax collectors were there who were the greatest traitors of all to all of Israel, kind of aligning themselves and manipulating the people for monetary gain, they were there. But they knew each other. And the, you had the Pharisees there who just could not stand the thought of being in the same room or same vicinity as these people that they really postulated themselves over. That I, I'm, I'm better than this person. I never chose that path. I chose the path to do what's right as a teenager. I did the right things. I went after God. I've stayed true my whole life. I, I am, I'm a God seeker is what I am. And then all of a sudden this guy that really messed things up shows up in the same gathering that this Pharisee does. And this outright traitor to the nation of Israel is standing here as well. And they're standing there with Jesus in front of all of them starting to wonder if this man's a prophet he's going to know who these people are and what they've done and we're about to have an excommunication out of this gathering they they won't be here very long and then all of a sudden the, the person that they went to school with that that messed everything up that totally just jacked up his life by making some bad decisions and chose the path of sin and sin just had complete dominion over this guy they see Jesus embrace and welcome this guy. And it just flew all over these guys. Because after all, they stayed true. They had done what's right. They, they sought after morality. They sought after, after God while others ran. And now that these are kind of coming into the place where Jesus is, they did not like it. Now, I know it's a far stretch for you to place yourself for that to be the picture of the church today because I know the church is nothing like that. We ought to be welcoming. The theme verse, I'm not going to say it again, but the theme verse I want you to remember tonight is He came to seek and save that which was lost. That's the heart of Jesus. He came to seek and save. That which was lost. And the Pharisees, the religious are there. Sitting in their own self-righteousness. Fulfilling the law the best that they know how to fulfill it. The sinner, the tax collector right beside them. They start grumbling. No, surely not. Not a God follower grumbling about a sinner. Let's just say coming to church. Surely not. 
You know, sometimes it's like we're amazed that sinners sin pretty good. There's one thing that sinners are good at. Sinning. Don't ever let that surprise you. When sinners sin good, they do a pretty good job at it. But these guys did not like the fact that they were there. Let's all get on that same page. I think we're there. Verse 1 says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. Heaven forbid a sinner come to Jesus. Heaven forbid. And the Pharisees and scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. And he tells three parables. And there's three themes in these parables that I want you to listen. And we're going to go back through these. But they all have these same elements. Number one, something valuable goes missing. The second thing is, God performs an all-out search for what's lost. The third thing is, when what was lost becomes found, it's time to party. Father, as we come before you tonight, Lord, we thank you that you still seek and save that which is lost. Lord, and because that's the Father's heart, Lord, implant that heart in each and every single one of us. Lord, I have found myself in the place of grumbling, Lord. Because of that very thing, forgive me, Jesus. That's our mission. That's our sole purpose of existence as your body, Lord, to carry your message of hope to those that have none. Forgive us, Lord. And let us carry your heart to this world. In Jesus' name, amen. You ever lost something and you can't find it? <laughs> daily. I try not to daily. Maybe it's keys. I, I always do pretty good with keys. I, I have this structure and it gets on my wife's nerves because I tell her all the time, everything has its place. I have spaces for everything. I put the fingernail clippers in the same spot every single time I use them. That way, when I go to get the fingernail clippers, I know where they are. What a brilliant idea. That's just how I am. Yeah, I'm tough to live with. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. She's about to go back into worship. To lose something. I talked this morning about when I lost my son at Disney World. And Cheryl Hazelton messaged me this afternoon. And she asked me, she said, did you ever find him? She said, you never finished the story. I just got to preach and I forgot to tell the rest of the story. Yeah, I, I found him. <laughs> Praise the Lord. After about ten minutes of frantic searching, I didn't care. If we had tickets to go on to the next ride, and if we, were, we could be the first in line, that didn't matter anymore. I had lost something, and I had to find, it's my most valuable possession, my son. He had ducked into a restaurant, and he just popped right back out ten minutes later. And I'm just like, I lost whatever hair I had. That's why I'm bald. <laughs> I had a full head of hair up till that moment. At that moment, something goes lost. And Jesus tells three stories. And I think we can see the heart of God in each of these three stories. Are you with me tonight? Luke chapter 15 verse 3. And he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not go leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? We... Most of us, there might be a sheep herder in here. There might be a rancher that corrals sheep. I don't know. I never have. I don't know the mindset of that. But I would imagine that if 99 are safe in a pen and you know that they're okay. If, yeah. <laughs> if there's one that gets lost, I would imagine that the appropriate response is not to say, Ah, oh, well, I got 99. Don't worry about that one. It'll be okay. If he comes back, it's fine. If not, I still got 99. That's a lot of mutton. It's okay. Just let him go. No, I, I wouldn't think anybody would do that. Jesus says, which person 
It would be crazy to have that mindset. Oh, we still got 99. Let, let them go. It's fine. Let them go. They're irrelevant. We still have 99. It doesn't matter. Just let them go. He says, and when he found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. There's those two elements. Something valuable gets lost. To a shepherd, their livelihood, their life is caring for sheep. And when a sheep went lost... That shepherd goes looking for them. I don't know anything about that type of sheep, but I know being the shepherd of a flock. Brother Parrish, it just hurts your heart when one of the sheep go missing. You know, you notice if somebody hasn't been here in a couple weeks, it hits you, and you can't go that week without sending a message out or trying to reach out. Where are you? I, I, we miss you. We need you. I get that element. I can kind of relate that way. Jesus says, he goes out. So there's the element of something valuable goes lost. There's the element of when it goes lost, we are supposed to go searching. And when he comes back, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. That's the heart of God. See, we, we like for God to celebrate us. And He is. He's pleased with us. He loves us. It, that, that's not a disrespect of the 99. It's the heart of a father that knows how to rejoice when something lost is found again. That's not a dishonor and a disrespect to those that weren't there. To those of you that have stood the test, you've stayed in church your whole life. It's not that God doesn't care about you. He loves you. He's proud of you. You are His. But there's great rejoicing, great rejoicing when that one's lost. He says, hey, let's have a party. Let's celebrate. And he's saying this. You've got to get the context here because you've got the, the sinner. You've got the traitor, tax collector, and you've got the self-proclaimed righteous person all there together. And he hears the grumbling. He hears it. He doesn't like it. He says, okay, let me tell you some stories, guys. And I imagine after this one story, Jesus can just pause. He just waits. And they have a party over the one that's found. And he just kind of sits back. I wonder if they got it. Did they get it? No, I don't think they got it. Let, let me tell you another one, guys. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one, there it is again. Ten silver coins. She lost a tenth of her wealth. Just like that. See? Let's get into that. You, you, you distance yourself from this story. Oh, it's just a coin. Let's look at it this way. She's lost a tenth of her wealth. Now, I know money's not important to you in this culture today. But imagine just like that, one tenth of your wealth was completely gone. You had... For some reason, you had sacks of money in your house divided up. And all of a sudden, one bag goes missing and a tenth of your money is completely gone. How many of you would think, ah, it's just a tenth, I still have 90%. It's all good. I can tell you what you're going to do. You're going to go find that sack of money. Here's the element. Something valuable goes missing. Element number two. They do not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. Let me tell you, that's how it would be in our house. Wouldn't say, ah, we were at Walmart. I'm sure it's there. I'm sure somebody turned it in. I'm going to bed. We'll check in the morning. One-tenth of your wealth. No, there will not be sleep. Find that sack of money. I need it. Show me the money. There we go. It says she sweeps the house clean until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, 
For I have found the coin which I lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. I you to follow this disconnect for a second. Now, it would mean something to us if it was our sack of money. But if someone else called us and said, hey, I lost a sack of money. Would you help me find? I'll pray for you. I'll pray that you find that. See the distinction? If it's ours, it means something. We've got to find it immediately. But if it's our neighbor's, I hope you find it. I wish you the best. I'm going to bed. It's 11 o'clock at night. Good luck finding that. So it is with God. God's heart is to seek and save that which is lost. Well, that's not my salvation. I, I, I'm, I'm proud of somebody else coming. No. We like it if it's us. But if it's somebody else, we need to learn how to celebrate. There's nothing more important to the heart of the Father than seeking and saving that which was lost. So here Jesus is in this crowd. He's told two stories to this diverse, contrasting group of people. And he sits back again. I can see him thinking, I wonder if they got that. Like, no, those Pharisees are pretty obstinate and arrogant. I still don't think they got it. Let me tell you one more. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. Now this story is told extremely intentionally to rub in the face of these Pharisees, to put his finger on their heart where they're at. He says, there's this man, he had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. Now they're starting to get it. Because, oh, Hank is looking at Frank over there. Hank the Pharisee is looking at Frank the sinner that he knew as a child. It's like, you know what? That sounds a lot like Frank. You did that very thing. You squandered your life away. Well, I stayed in church. I went to temple every day. I followed the right path. I chose righteousness. I chose morality. I chose to follow God. And you went out there and ruined it. You lost your chance. And you don't deserve to be here with us. They got it. But Jesus continues. And he says, and when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in the country, and he began to be in need. Can't you see the distinction in the crowd? The sinner, the tax collector, they're getting it. Because they're in that place of need. You know what sinners need more than anything? They need hope. And somewhere along the way, we as the church that are supposed to be carrying the heart of the Father have changed our message from that of hope to that of judgment. They know they're lost. They know they've ruined it. This guy, he says, severe famine arose and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself to one of the citizens of the country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything. The question is, where was the church in that time? Where was the church when a sinner who totally destroyed his life is eating pig pods, living in the pig pen. Where was the church then? Where was the righteous that was reaching out to them then that was supposed to carry the heart of the Father? Come back. Daddy's home. He still wants you. He still loves you. Where were they? How can we be comfortable when there's people all across this world 
that's living in that state right now. See, Jesus is drawing this stark contrast between the two hearts that's represented. And I tell you that the message still rings true today. The church is far too comfortable knowing what the rest of the world is in. Because we're sitting in the same place that the Pharisees were in that gathering. Comfortable with their life. Knowing that they've done the right thing. And Jesus just digs his finger in that issue. Here's a guy. Living. Completely squandered his life. Yes, I admit, they messed up. He missed it. He ruined it. He made poor decisions. But where were we? Something that crawls all over me is when I hear comments like that, they don't need to be here. They don't deserve to be here. They're not good enough. And we forget that neither were we. He says, when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I'll arise and go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. We've got something valuable that's gone lost. And he arose and came to his father. Here's the second element. But while he was a long way off, his father saw him and he felt compassion. And he ran and embraced him and kissed him. Here's the heart of the father. Something valuable goes missing. He searches diligently. I would imagine there wasn't a day that passed by that that father didn't go to the end of the driveway. Looking, is he coming? Imagine a day didn't pass that he didn't go down to the marketplace and inquire, have you seen my son? Where is he? And the son said to him, Father, I'd sinned against heaven and before you. He's starting his speech. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But his father interrupted him. And he said to him, Bring quickly the best robe. Put it on him. Put the ring on his hand and the shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it. Something valuable goes missing. The father goes searching. And now it's time to party. For this my son was dead. He's alive. He was lost, but now he's found. And they begin to celebrate. Why? Because it's not the righteous in need of repentance. Sinners. And the heart of the Father is to see sinners turn to Him because He came to seek and save that which was lost. As if He hadn't driven the point home enough in three stories in this contrasting crowd, He's just going to stick it to the Pharisees a little bit more. He says, Now there was an older son. He couldn't have been any more blatant if he would have said, Now you, I'm talking about you that stayed here the whole time, that did the right thing, that served, that never squandered your life. I'm talking to you now, Pharisees. Can I have your attention, please? It couldn't have been any more blatant if Jesus would have said that. But he says there's an older son in the field, and as he came and drew near the house, he heard music and dancing. Heaven forbid that we rejoice over a sinner coming into the house of the Lord and trying to get right with God. But there became a distaste in his mouth. And he called one of the servants and asked, What do these things mean? In other words, what's this about? What's interesting to me is, the other son stayed at home the whole time, but he still didn't have the heart of the father. What is this? 
Why the celebration? Why the dancing? Why the music? What do you mean, why? You mean you've spent all this time with the Father and His heart is not your heart? You don't understand why? What an accurate picture. Why? And he called one of the servants and asked him what these things meant. And he said to him, your brothers come. And your father has killed the fattened calf. Because he has received him back safe and sound. Once again, the heart of the father. Seeking and saving that which was lost. But he was angry and refused to go in. And his father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look at these many years. I've served you. I've never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I could have a party with some friends. But when this son of yours came who has devoured your property with prostitutes and completely destroyed his life, you have killed the fattened calf. And he said to him, Son, you're always with me. And all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this brother of yours was dead and he's alive. He was lost But now he's found. Three elements. One, something valuable goes missing. Two, the heart of the father is you search diligently until that thing missing becomes found. Three, there's a party when you find it. Why is this not the vision of the church today? Why am I standing in a gathering? I'm not calling you Pharisees. I'm calling us Pharisees. Where's the sinners and tax collectors in the gatherings today? Where are they? Where's those that squandered their life away? Why don't they feel comfortable being with us today? Where are those that just made the worst decision of their lives? Why don't they feel comfortable running to the only place where they have hope? Why? Why are we not concerned about our brothers and sisters living in the pig pens of life because of the decisions they've made? Where is the heart of the Father in the church today? Why are we not going out in the highways and byways, seeking and saving that which was lost? Where did we change our message from hope to judgment? Because the Father's heart is to seek and save that which was lost. I tell you, church, we've got to regain the Father's heart. And something keeps us from celebrating Sinners coming back into fellowship with God. We're okay as long as it's on our terms. I don't think the brother was against the brother coming back. I think the brother was against the celebration that took place. I think he would have loved if he came back and the father did treat him like one of the servants so he could hold it over his head. See, you messed up. You're still here. I'm in the place of honor because I didn't do what you did. I don't think it was against him coming back. He loved him somewhat. He just didn't want him to get what he got. Somewhere along the road, we've become more concerned about what's coming to us. You know, it's like the parable that Jesus told about the guy that went out to hire people to work in the field. you remember this? One, he, oh, he hired it, let's just say 9 o'clock. And he agreed on a certain wage. Remember this? Then he went out and the work wasn't getting done. He went out at, let's just say, 11. And he said, hey, come on in. And he agreed with them a certain wage. Then he went out at 1 and then at 3. 
And then the quitting time is 5 o'clock. He went out, let's say at 4.45. He said, hey guys, there's still some work to be done. Come on in. And when it came payday, boy, he paid the guy that worked 15 minutes a massive amount of money. The same agreement that the guy at 9 o'clock had. And the guy at 9 o'clock is sitting there thinking, if he got this... I'm about to get a fat paycheck. And then all of a sudden, the 3 o'clock guy got a paycheck, and it, it was the same as the 445. It's like something's not adding up here. 9 o'clock sitting there thinking, okay, still, I've been here all day. He, it's going to be good. 1 o'clock came, same wages. 11 o'clock, same wages. 9 o'clock came... And he paid him the same thing that that guy that only worked 15 minutes got. And he is ticked completely off. What gives? I have worked for you all day long. And this bum that sat out there under the tree all day and came in and worked 15 minutes got the same thing I got. What's the deal? I said, hey, did I not agree to pay you a certain wage? Yes then it's none of your business what I do for anybody else. Boy, that just crawled all over that guy. And truthfully, it crawls all over us. But it shouldn't. Because the heart of a father is to seek and save that which is lost. Thank God that those that come in the church in the midnight hour, thank God for those that get saved right before the appearing of the Lord. Thank God for those deathbed repentances that make things right before they slip into eternity. You mean they get the same salvation you do? They sure do. Thank God for that. But I've lived for it my whole life. They're going to the same heaven I am. There's not like levels. I live in the better subdivision because I've served you my whole life. No, it's level ground at the foot of the cross. Thank you, Jesus. What are you getting at, Richie? A couple of things. I want to see a stark contrast in the crowd in Christian Fellowship Church. I want the rank of sinner in town in here, and I want them feeling comfortable to come in and to be embraced and to receive a message of hope and change in Jesus Christ. And not to be cast aside. And not to be grumbled against. Why are you here? You used to come here. Till you lost it and messed up. Now you're not welcome. I want to see the rankest sinner in town come into this place. I want to see the biggest drunk in Marshall County come and sit in the pew. And I want to see the elder brother come and lay their arms around them and embrace him. Saying, you know what, we're glad to have you. The father's been waiting for you to come. I want to see the adulterer come in this door. And us embrace them and say, the Father's been waiting for you to come back. We're glad to have you. Kill the fattened calf, guys. Why? Because we celebrate when that which was lost becomes found. It's the heart of the Father. Something goes missing. We search diligently until it's found. And then we party. Father, in the name of Jesus, put your heart in us. Lord, what a powerful illustration that you drew in this gathering that you told these stories to Lord you put your finger on an issue Lord and unfortunately we're still not getting it right 2,000 years later change us change this place Lord where our heart becomes your heart to seek and save that which was lost the heart of the father has not changed Lord, but we have. And our message is changed from hope to judgment. Forgive us, Lord. And let us not sleep until we sweep the house clean, looking, Father, for that which was lost. Lord, don't let us stay complacent in these church chairs, Lord, while our brothers, while our daughters and sons are living in the pig pens, Lord. Don't let us be complacent with that, God, because it's not... Okay, it's not all right, Lord. You desire for them to come back, Lord. Give us the heart 
of diligent searching, Father, and implant your heart in ours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Love you guys. We can be dismissed tonight. Wednesday night at 6 o'clock, the meal for the clusters, and we are starting a new cluster.